the idea was capitalism, modernity or new medievalism. And so we are slightly departing from uh, the topics we have been addressing in, in the last session. But I guess there is a larger connection in a sense, well, hopefully so, at least. Uh, so to summarize what we're going to talk about, um, the points are here. Well, first, first of all, I'm going to define what uh, I will refer to as modernity, capitalism, and the state system. And uh, I will start from the idea that modernity has assumed in the West at least some connotations, and I will focus most of all on the state and capitalism as signs of modernity. And I will show how the relationship between the state and the capitalist system, or the state and the market, has shifted. So while once upon a time the state used the economy to promote its own goals, now the economy has an increasing power over state structures. Okay? So I will uh, actually move to contemporary forms of capitalism, namely neoliberalism, uh, and the effects that neoliberalism has in our societies to show why the, the idea of the title, why new medievalism. Um, this will lead me to actually uh, reach the, the question whether uh, the, the mo most elaborate versions of the political systems and the economic systems we have today are actually not promoting inclusive, egalitarian, not to say just systems, uh, and therefore we have new forms of exploitation, marginalization, and so forth. So that's that's the, the main framework. Uh, however, having said this, uh, one of the points here is also to to actually shed light on on the fact that we have varieties of capitalism. Even in the West, even in industrialized countries, we don't have one form of capitalism which is exactly the same, but there are differences in structural pressures, there are differences in institutional frameworks, and differences in cultural values, so that different forms of capitalism actually live one with the other, actually compete one with the other. So if you look at Sweden, or if you look at Germany, or if you look at Japan, or the US, they have all very different kinds of capitalism. So when we say neoliberalism or capitalism, we're actually making a very broad simplification because the consequences on the societies are very different. And so, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a moment. Um, however, uh, having this premise of the varieties of capitalism, there is one feature of today's neoliberal understanding that goes quite across countries despite these varieties. Is, there is an increasing predominance of economics over politics, or at least a merge between the two. Whereas at one point in time, economics was understood as sort of a household matter, and then there was politics. Now they are either at the same level or actually economics prevails, so that we have to do something to support the economic system to survive. The economic system is not something that we use <laughs> as a means. We have to die for the, for the system. Um, in this sense, uh, I will conclude basically uh, arguing that uh, neoliberalism has some similarity to religion because it became a sort of secular religion and the force of capitalism does not rely on coercion but rather on its ideological component. Okay, so this is more or less the structure. I know it's why. <laughs> I know it's not exactly what I ask my students to do, is don't talk about general things. So I, I know, I know, it's a mess. What can we do? So, Western modernity. Um, I tend to, to specify Western modernity uh, because uh, it's quite a specific process. So there are a number of features that we actually link to modernity. For instance, we say that we have the shift to modernity when we, we go from the personal rule to formal authority structures uh, in a specific time period, namely the creation of the state. So 1648, the Peace of Westphalia. And that's certainly one of the features of what we call a modern system. Uh, at that point in time, the governments acquired the capacity to control the territory. We didn't have that kind of system that we had in the fe feudal era, as you know, uh, serfs and, and, and so on and so forth. We have 
the ability to control the society, we have the ability to extract resources from the society through taxation, we have, we develop the, the idea of having arms, people actually fight for their own country, so the idea of nationalism is built together with the idea of state to, to maintain them together. Of course, one of the features of modernity is enlightenment, so scientific knowledge and rationality, and the freedom of the individual and the individual rights takes place over the idea of arbitrary rule. So the idea of the rule of law. So nobody is above the law and so on and so forth. So basically we have this idea of creating institutions, this idea of progressive democratization. All these are elements that we actually attach to, to modernity. And one of these elements together uh, with the ones just mentioned is the creation and institution of private property. So private property replaces systems of possession and in order to actually guarantee private property you need to have a state because the state has to enforce the law. So the creation of contracts and so on and so forth. So in all this, you know, in all this very big generalization of what we call modernity, I will focus on two of these aspects, that is the state system and capitalism and see their evolution and how they evolve up to today's uh, society. Uh, now, I would like just to, 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 to make a sort of couple of fingers on, on the definition of modernity, because also going back to Mariana's presentation, we have these two broad uh, ways of defining what is modern, and uh, these sort of acultural and cultural understanding of modernity. So basically, you can look at the determinants of modernity and you can say, well, what triggered modernity? And then you can say, well, enlightenment, rationalization, scientific development, these are the triggers of development. And basically, when you look at the modernity in this way, you, you can see a sort of um, the creation of a path, of a social transformation of our society. And basically, the assumption is all societies to be modern have to go through these kind of moments, okay? That is of necessity, <laughs> a very linear understanding. And so, going against uh, Lyle's prediction um, about my speech, uh, an example is the equation between the decline of religious practice and modernity. Well, not necessarily you need to have modernity to have, uh, not necessarily you need to have a decline of religious practices to have modernity, but that's the assumption of the acultural understanding of modernity. So Taylor was one of those who was actually on the side of the cultural understanding, saying, well, actually, you can have modernity in different settings, in different environments, and not necessarily they will have to follow the Western, European, ethnocentric, secular path to modernity. So this was my little mm -hmm. qualification about modernity. So having said this, I will focus on, on, on the creation of the state as a, as a first step because that actually is a crucial moment in, from the pre to the modern uh, era. Uh, now, the state system has some structural elements, but also some social elements are very relevant. And basically, I will focus on the social one, that is, uh, I will consider the state as a sort of an evolving social institution, because it's still today changing, and it's changing dramatically. Uh, now, what were the features of the state when the piece of this failure that we place it there, but of course the process was a long process, it started in the medieval ages and then at that point the agreement was made. Well, of course, to have a state you need to have domestic sovereignty and the idea that all states are equal. Of course, this is the ideal. Um, and another feature was the idea that people emancipated from a system of personal rule, so you don't have some crazy people waking up and killing other people because they woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And the establishment, therefore, of principles of law. So the idea was also that you had this social contract in the state, okay? So someone was ruling and you were giving up part of your freedom and in exchange you would have security. You could talk about Hobbes and we won't do that. Um, of course, <laughs> following Krasner, he wrote this very famous book that is called Organized, uh, State Sovereignty or Organized Hypocrisy. He said, yes, of course, yes, we created these 
states or all juridical equivalents, yeah, only in Europe, because of course this didn't apply until recently to all the world, because we had colonialism. And uh, for a long period of time, we actually enslaved lots of people <laughs> and so on and so forth. So he said, yes, that system actually applied only in a very limited part of the world for a long time, because not all of these principles were respected globally. Okay? Now, what we see if we follow the idea of the state as a social constructed norm is that the state is changing even today. And of course, the, the best example to show this is the construction of the European Economic Community and then the European Union, where the states are pooling their sovereignty and therefore the state as a unit, as a unit that controls the territory or the unit that has supreme power over everything is being challenged. Okay? Now, what is interesting is that the European Union is going on one side and is trying to create a different kind conceptual sovereignty, whereas our countries across the world, very different from the US to China and Russia, who stick to a very traditional conceptual sovereignty. Hmm? But sovereignty is also changing in respect to the fact that once upon a time, those who were in power had the right to be Now the principle of sovereignty is more and more conceived as, as a responsibility. And so we have the doctrine of the responsibility to protect. And so that is how some countries could invade Libya, at least to protect civilians. Well, that was not actually the point. Uh, so, but this is to say the concept of sovereignty was created, but the concept of sovereignty has been changing and is still changing and is still evolving. Okay, so we attach to the concept certain ideas that are still today evolving. And in all this, in all this process, from the creation of the state as an institution, a social, constructed institution up to today, we can say that the state uh, is now facing many challenges. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges? Well, first of all, because compared to modern states, today's states are not actually fighting and competing very much for territory. Yes, they're doing that in certain areas of the world. We have these proxy wars. But mostly, today, states are fighting and competing for market shares, for the market. Not, they are not actually moving armies to conquer other, other lands, okay? So, increasingly, the economy gained a very, very important role, not only for states, but independently of states. We saw the emergence of non-state actors, both economic and non-economic actors, that are challenging the power of the state. So multinational corporations and terrorist organizations, they both challenge the power and the authority of the state. But we also see how the state is not able to cope with transnational challenges, be those security-wise or the environment. Okay? <coughs> we also see how states are Increasingly, cha increasingly challenged by ethnic divisions. And we see this in Europe with uh, <laughs> the idea of Catalonia as a state that wants to separate from Spain. Of course, there are very can't claim self determination because there is no violation of human rights, but yet. And another dimension that shows how the power of the state structure is challenged is the role of intergovernmental institutions. For instance, the International Monetary Fund imposes certain structural adjustment programs on certain countries which need the money and have to change their own policies independently of their preferences. Now, we were fine with this until this applied to the developing world. Now, with the 2008 financial crisis, these kind of plans are applied also in Europe for the first time. We silent. So now the concept of sovereignty is coming again. So is that right or not? Okay, we are, we are asking ourselves because now this is going to this is impacting our own Western societies. Now the point here is that in this process, from the construction of the state as an institution up to today, the idea was well, we create these institutions and we actually liberate. People, because people are not subjects anymore, they become citizens. Okay? So the idea is that this kind of structure should satisfy the need of the people and should actually enable people to live in, in the modern era. And that is, they have to live, for instance, not in slavery. So that this, this process should help people to live in a different kind of system with different rights. And yet we have seen the colonial, post-colonial relationships of dependence 
we see how migration is used uh, as a forced labor or exploitation. Because, for instance, when you say that migration is legal, and when we have migrants, then they are out of the law, and then you can exploit them because they don't exist. And because, well, basically the structural power also served to impose, to impose certain kind of agreements in security or economical trade that were not necessarily benefiting all partners, let's put it that way. So, the decolonization, the delocalization of multinational corporations in many developing countries well, facilitates those companies to produce with child labor, with the exploitation of human rights. We see in Congo, they need uh, to, they have child that work in the mines to produce our iPhones and our computers. So we know this, and we still buy these products, so we are part of it. So not that there are, are bad multinational corporations doing that, we are buying those products, so we are part of it. Um, so what, what is all this telling us? Well, this is telling us several things. Uh, on the one hand, we created these institutions which at the modern, in the modern times seem to actually liberate people from the kind of power relationship that there were during the imperial uh, times, okay? And so these structures were meant uh, to promote freedom and at, at the political and economic level. Um, but gradually we see problems with the state structure, so with the political structure, and gradually we also see a reversal of the dependent and independent variable in the state market relationship. Because once upon a time the state used the economy for its needs, and now it seems that the economy is taking um, power over the state. So, but the point I would like to make very clear is not that the market took power over the state. The state gave the power to the market. So, market forces were allowed to have a say in regulations, in law. They have the power to lobby, they have the power to say which, you know, which rules should abide, which, which kind of health regulation we should have, which, but it, the, the, but it, the power was given to them. They acquired that power, but the, 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 the path was set open. And why is that so? Well, my take is, it has been a long process, and the idea that neoliberalism is the sort of a peculiar feature of our nowadays is not so valid because actually we can see its roots very well, quite back in history, uh, and we already had in the 19th century this idea of you know progress of modernity can come only if we open the road to markets. Okay, now <clears throat> so. That kind of idea was coming from the marriage of positivism, utilitarianism, and economics with German Japan. So the idea was well, basically <clears throat> all the modern idea of you know being modern, applying scientific reasonings, and promoting certain kinds of economic doctrines uh, would actually liberate and bring the greatest goods to the greatest amount of people. That was utilitarianism. And what were people? Well, people were actually rational actors that were promoting their own self-interest uh, directly to utility maximization. So can you see that how the frames we use today have been set quite some time ago? They are not new, novel. They, they don't represent any kind of uh, novelty. Now, <clears throat> That kind of framework uh, has been has been there and was used during the first era of globalization, that is, during the Belle Epoque, uh, 1870, 1914. Let's, let's put it that way. After World War One, everything changed. After World War One, we well, we had a country that basically fought in a war, were destroyed, system collapsed, and then we had the Great Depression. And so, of course, that kind of uh, idea of the market can solve everything could not be used because we had societies that were completely dis disintegrated. So at that point in time, everybody looked at Keynes and, and yeah, of course, the state should have a role and the state intervene in the economy and so on and so forth. It was, not, it was still not <laughs> very, very, very successful because that period of depression and so on led to nationalism and so on until we had World War II, of course. Um, after World War II, 
the idea of the role of the state in the economy was, was still dominant. The governments could not actually delegate the power to the market because the, the societies were destroyed. So the idea was we have to integrate our societies, our economies, trying to go back to the belly block, but with a big caveat. It is but we have to actually also respond to domestic needs. It is we have to stabilize our, our societies. Why? Well, basically, they needed to provide employment. They needed to actually assure the people that fought in the war without a leg, without you know, a husband or whatever. They had to take care of the society. Right, well, societies changed from World War I to World War II because basically people, for instance, started voting. Even women, can you imagine? They started voting, so people started having the say in what governments should have done or should not have done. And so governments had to give some answers to the people, to their own societies. So the, the, the political economy could not just be left to the market. You could not just leave entire segments of the society, well, survive or die. So they had to manage that process. So the kind of political economy that was actually built after World War II was called the embedded liberalism. But liberal exactly because it's liberalism, we promote integration, we do that, but we do that taking into account domestic concerns. So all the Bretton Woods system was meant to manage this kind of system. Okay? So that kind of capitalism was a capitalist where the state had a huge role. There were a state, there was a big role for the state, and there were the creation of lots of institutions, multilateral institutions. So we have the IMF, the World Bank that now we see in a certain light. But the creation of those institutions was a novelty. Okay? The, the principle, per se, was a, was a great novelty. <coughs> so, why are we where we are today? Why do we have this counter-reformation at a certain point in time? Why all that embedded liberalism collapsed? Well, there are clear, clear reasons for that. In the 1970s, we had a big crisis. See? <laughs> Everybody agrees. Uh, we had a big crisis. In 1971, a prediction of a famous economist called Triffin, who wrote in 1958 a very famous prediction, actually came true. Because economists can actually give predictions. This economist said, well, we have a financial system that is based on the dollar. That is, we have the gold dollar standard. And he said, well, basically, now, well, in a few years, if everybody who holds a dollar wants to convert the dollar into gold, they will not be able to do so. Why? Well, because the US is printing dollars to give dollars to the friends, to this, to wage a war in Vietnam, to that. So basically, if you continue printing dollar, and if the idea is the convertibility of the dollar to gold, that, that, that's not going to work for a long time. Uh, so in 1971, the US naturally said, Fixed exchange rates based on the dollar did. We are not going to convert, we're not going to convert dollar to gold. It seems a minor thing because a major thing. Because at that point you say that the actually the, the value of the currency is not set by the government, but it's set by the market. Okay? It's set by the market. So you will pay how many pounds to have the dollar? It's set by the market, not by the government. So you see a dynamic of shift. Then we have the 1973 crisis, then there are lots of crises in the 1970s. Basically, Western economies went through stagflation, to, well, horrible times, and so, and so what happened? All those economies that were put aside after World War I and after World War II, who were the very strong fundamentalist market open ideas, they said, see, this system is not working. See, we have the economic crisis, we have to go back to the market. So at that point in time, these ideas were quite successful and they were embraced. They were promoted academically by the Chicago School of Economics. They were embraced by very powerful, powerful figures in Paul's country. Prime Minister Thatcher and President Ronald Reagan were you know, the, the best. Uh, vocal speakers for a new kind of approach towards economics. That is, let's put aside the state, let's open the way for the markets. Now, of course, you had also 
strong interest in that. So lobbies and firms were pushing for that. But it's, let's liberate the economy from all these reports that are oppressing our economies. So it was <coughs> a great systemic change where the balance between state and market actually shifted completely on the hands of the state of the, of the market. Okay. Uh, looking at uh, trying to, to find some data I was uh, looking at Milano, which he's an expert on inequality, and he actually did a, did a study showing uh, the changes in the distribution of income between 1988 and 2008, uh, and he actually showed that the changes in the distribution of income in this period uh, actually represents the profoundest global reshuffle of people's economic uh, position since the Industrial Revolution. So I found this quite interesting. Um, and this is all dependent on a certain kind of path that uh, was taken and was taken by the political structures, not by the economy. Hmm? So, uh, the result is that most of the power and most of the power was actually handed to market forces. Okay? So, capitalism is eternity. Capital was considered uh, the only way to actually achieve modernity. So I, I just brought this quote from Mitchell. Uh, the power of what we call capitalism rests increasingly on its ability to portray itself as a unique and universal form, on producing a view of history and of economy in which the market is the universal system, constituted and propelled forward by the power of its own interior logic. So, it's very true that it's, it's not really that we have to look at very powerful lobbies. It's really the progressive, actually, the, the ability of, of the ideology of capitalism to become hegemonic, the change of structure. Because, because actually, if you look at the data, uh, it is quite interesting that with the application of the recipe, of neoliberalism, the data don't match the expectations, don't match the theory to uh, some extent. That is, it's true that with the uh, promotion of uh, strong neoliberal policies, we can actually see at the aggregate level an increase of the GDP in most countries, but this increase is very unequal. And inequality has been rising also in industrialized countries incredibly. So the opponents of this view actually say yes, but at the same time you can see that there has been the greatest reduction in human poverty in history in this same period of time, since the 1980s up to today, because 500 million Chinese people were lived out of extreme poverty. I agree, but the role of the state in the Chinese economy is very strong. It has been very strong since the 1980s. Of course, today is quite different, but that is a very different system from the Western neoliberal system. Okay, so I think we have to qualify this to understand the macro uh, picture. So, having said this, uh, my point is that uh, all these changes depend on the fact that basically the state gave and open the road for market forces to take the power. But political power still has the ability to influence what happens in society. And so I will go back to the point of the varieties of capitalism. It is not all capitalist systems are equal. Uh, why? Well, because there are structural conditions, institutional patterns, and also cultural values that differ among the countries, which make each system quite different from the other. So Germany and Japan have sort of corporate capitalist system. The Anglo-Saxon system is very neoliberal. Mm -hmm. And then you have Sweden or the Nordic countries. Completely different system. They are welfare system. They are all capitalists, but they are all very, very different. Because see, the point here is, if you look just at Western, industrialized, or OECD countries that are the most advanced industrialized countries in the world, the patterns of capitalism are very, very, very different, okay? 
Uh, well, this is the case that, um, well, I'll mention this briefly, just, just for you to, to give us signs, at least one case of the presentation, <laughs> so that it won't be too abstract. There, there are these two uh, very famous authors, uh, Robinson and Ace Mongo, who published a book uh, that is called Why Nations Fail. And they ask themselves why some nations are not able to catch up. That is, why some nations that actually do all the things that they were told to do, they do apply the recipe, <laughs> they try to do the cake, as the neoliberal system said, but the recipe, the, the cake doesn't come out. Either it's flat or whatever. Why? Well, basically, they say, well, institutions matter. They have a very liberal understanding, so they don't look at structural dimensions, but they say, their understanding is institutions matter. So they compare, for instance, Mexico and the US. And they say, well, in Mexico, when they started the privatization of, of uh, the telephone companies, a very, very big, powerful man called Carlos Slim, one of the most rich persons in the world, bought the company. So it didn't actually, it didn't become private. <laughs> you had a state monopoly who became a sort of private possession. So what's the difference? Is that if you don't have proper institutions, for instance antitrust institutions, that kind of pattern doesn't work. So they were actually mentioning how Bill Gates had to go and testify in the US to the antitrust commission. Bill Gates was in uh, Microsoft was imposed a $800 billion fine by the European Commission for the antitrust practices in the European Union. But if, if you don't have proper institutions, that kind of recipe doesn't give the results that are expected. So you cannot actually apply them across all the countries as if, you know, magic <laughs> doesn't work. And even in the US there are problems, I not to say that, <laughs> never done it, just to, just to mention. Okay. So, um, the point, and I'm almost, almost done, I know uh, you're all tired, you look very tired and I'm almost done. The point here is that uh, political and economic modernity together are quite an exception today. You don't see them working very well one with the other, okay? And the exceptions might be, to a certain extent, Scandinavian countries, where you have strong, stable, institutional political structures and you have people who have a very high tenure uh, of living. Uh, that is to say, since the French Revolution up to our days, we don't see this double inclusive nature of our political and economic system. Uh, that is, and the inclusive nature, I, 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 I associate this with modernity. And the reason are the, the, the facts that we were that I was mentioning before, uh, that significant part of the workforce for the satisfaction of our needs is uh, is being performed by non-citizens or has been performed by non-citizens in most of our countries. Uh, we have apartheid in, in South Africa. We had uh, colonialism and post-colonialism, and today we have the issue of, of migration, which we treat as we know we treat it. Uh, that is dealing with. Uh, Libya uh, and making people die in the Mediterranean in the city. Um, so what's, what's the problem here? Well, it, it seems that the political and the economic uh, dimensions of modernity uh, don't lead to inclusive systems and that people are more a function of the economy rather than the opposite, because it should be the other way around. So to conclude, uh, the question is, uh, do contemporary economic political structures satisfy the defining features of modernity? Well, uh, not really to a certain extent, uh, because the state structure is challenged by all the dimensions we were looking at before this, by international governmental organizations that have a certain say on the autonomy, on the state sovereignty, uh, because the states are not able to cope with transnational issues outside their own, and they're not able to cope with national tensions and rivers within their own states. And most of these states have been permeated by this sort of mantra, of dominant spirit of the neoliberalism. And this actually brought some, in itself, to some extent, to new forms of medievalism. So we don't have the divine might, but we have economic might. And we also have a new aristocracy that has been empowered 
and it has its own privileges and honors. And this new aristocracy, what is interesting is that it doesn't feel this first, this national capture to the country. In fact, we can see the Paradise Papers, they don't pay the taxes because <laughs> who cares? Um, and this idea of people as that they are individuals and they are in terms of individual rights, instead of freeing people, you're you're we have been creating people that feel this sort of atomistic nature of the society, so they don't actually bond together. We don't have community of citizens, we have individuals. And those individuals are actually giving away rights that were defended by the previous generations. We have lots of people who don't go and vote. Many people died for the right to vote. We have lots of workers who are actually giving up rights that were actually acquired a long time ago. Economic exploitation and so on and so forth. So the, the point, the basic point here is that to a certain extent it seems that the ideology of the neoliberal system has uh, created something, uh, to, we, we, we mentioned this with Mariana, something like a secular religion. And this secular religion is believed. We believe in the necessity of, of this secular religion. We believe also in the benefits of the secular religion. But even though we can believe in the market, then we can qualify how to make the market work for people, not because the market doesn't have to <laughs> succeed for itself. And so the point is that to a great extent, the state retreated to empower the market as if the market could work by itself. And everybody refers to Smith and the business hand, and Smith never said the things that people say Smith said. <laughs> Basically, nobody read Smith ever. But this, this is the point. Thank you.